Now Nietzsche came upon the scene shortly after another really great figure, his name was Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant basically said, uh, you know, the trouble with modernity is that it's a very passive, you know, in other words, uh, the, the main disposition of modernity is passive. In other words, just attend to worship before the clear distinct ideas, uh, submit to the, uh, to the, to the bias and submit to the general will. In other words, the, uh, the trouble with uh, modernity is that it, um, uh, it uh, establishes command obedience relations where most people basically just are put into the position of, of, of you know, giving obedience and so forth to commands and so forth and so on. Now we will see something of that in uh, what I shall be describing later as disciplinarity, you know, as understood by Foucault. But in any case, uh, Emmanuel Kant said, you know, the disposition of modernity is too much uh, sort of like invested in passivity. So why don't, you know, at, you know the, when you think about the intellect, you know, Kant says, the intellect is not passive. The intellect is not like, as John Locke had described it, the intellect is not like an empty cabinet, you know, just uh, waiting for things to fill it up, to kind of fly in by chance and so forth and so on. No, the intellect ups and goes. The, intellects, uh, the intellect sort of like grabs at things in the manifold of sensibility and so forth and so on. It doesn't just uh, sit pretty. It's just like, it's not a wallflower. It's not one tamad. You know, it, it, it actually uh, ups and goes. Of course, it cannot absorb all of uh, the manifold of sensibility, but, you know, whatever it can, it'll go for, and so forth and so on. And, uh, and so he says, you know, you really cannot go wrong with a, uh, an understanding of the intellect that's also active, so long as you remain within the bounds of time and space, which is to say, so long as you remain within the bounds of human history, and so forth and so on. Now, one person who took that advice to great heart was Friedrich Nietzsche. In other words, Friedrich Nietzsche, on the advice of Kant, on the wisdom of Kant, basically said, okay, I'm gonna leave my ivory tower, because you know, I mean, Professionally, Nietzsche started out as a man of the university. He was a he was a graduate student at one of I forget which German university, um, and uh, greatly admired by his professor. So greatly admired that uh, even as a graduate student um, only, he was given his own classes to teach in Germany, at a place where professors, university professors, are uh, treated like gods, you know. And uh, uh, but you know Nietzsche. Of course, as an insider to that system, eventually developed a dislike for that system, a contempt for that system. He wanted out of that system. And so he arranged for his expulsion from that system by presenting as his dissertation the very first book that he produced called The Birth of Tragedy. Anyway, the, the point in all of his writings is, uh, uh, at the trouble with The Birth of Tragedy, it was only 100 pages long, had no footnotes, and so forth and so on. Uh, so in other words, he, it looked like anything but uh, 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 a legitimate dissertation, and so his professors expelled him from the university, which is exactly what he wanted uh, to happen. So, uh, and then he spent the rest of his life writing volume after volume after volume of uh, works against the creeping nihilism of his time. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. Where, from where he stood, don't forget, don't ever forget, Nietzsche lived towards the end of the 19th century. So therefore, from his perspective, uh, the moral systems and the moral values of his time, as far as he understood it, including the Christian values, he correctly understood that these value systems were had grown insipid. You know, they, that, you know the word insipid means you know like when a carbonated drink loses all of its fizz, you know it becomes insipid. You know, not nice to drink, it just becomes a, a syrupy, uh, you know, liquid that tastes bad in the mouth and so forth and so without carbonation. So. Uh, well, his point was, you know, the moral systems of his time had grown so insipid they would not be able to animate people to put up resistance, resistances, credible resistances, resistances to the oncoming storm. Now, don't forget that the oncoming storm means the cataclysmic 20th century, the two world wars, the fascisms, the totalitarianisms, the genocides, the holocausts, you know, Cambodia in our own part of the world, Rwanda, Bosnia, Herzegovina. In other words, Nietzsche, from where he stood, saw all of that coming, you know. In other words, uh, as a result of the, uh, you know, the failed nation-state experiments, you know, of modernity, uh, millions of people were being cast adrift, and in, 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 in that condition, they were right precisely for ideologues to take over, who would then lead them into fascism, totalitarianism, holocausts, and so forth and so on. 
And so he just spent all his, all the time that he had a mind, because the last 14 years of his life, he spent in an insane asylum, not because he was thinking too much, but because of the delayed effects of syphilis, which he had contracted in his youth. And uh, so, but up to that point, everything that he wrote was a work precisely against uh, what he called at nihilism, or the idea that a, a romancing of nothingness, you know, a romancing of fantasy formations. The kind of fantasy formations, for example, that motivated the Nazis to uh, establish killing fields, killing factories, you know, uh, the kind of fantasy formations that motivated the world at the time when there were no more than two billion people in the world to uh, to decimate 100 million of their number in the world wars, in the genocides, and so forth and so on, all on the basis of fantasy formations, such as the fantasy formation of the Nazis, you know, uh, all these people targeted for extermination, their life unfit for life, they're even lower down than cockroaches. Now that's only a fantasy formation, but yet on the basis of that, so many people died. Okay? Stalin of the former Soviet Union, I mean, arranged for the for the death of uh, you know millions of peasants, far more like 20 million peasants. That's that's far more than the six million Jews uh, uh, systematically annihilated by the Nazis, or uh, uh, you know uh, by means of uh, systematically planned uh, uh, you know uh, failures of the harvest. So Stalin in that way. That's why those among you who may be romancing uh, Marxism and so forth and so on, I would recommend to you first before you do, you know, you better look at the record of Stalin. You know. He murdered 20 million people. That's far more than the Nazis did. Okay. Uh, so I mean, uh, better look at the record first before you, uh, without uh, you know much uh, interrogation, you know, just sort of like give yourselves over to Marxist fantasies and so forth and so on.